everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We will get started in just one moment. When you're ready, Stacy. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for our last virtual Rebel Recharge Lecture for the spring 2021 session. While our current lecture schedule is drawing to a close, rest assured that we have been hard at work planning our next round of engaging and educational talks that will be shared very soon. It has been exciting to watch this program grow, thrive, and educate our alumni and friends in the virtual environment. And we are thrilled so many of you continue to join us each and every time. My name is Stacy Purcell, and I am the president of the UNLV Alumni Association. And it is my honor to personally welcome each and every one of you here today. I would also like to give special welcome to Blake Douglas, our interim associate vice president for alumni engagement and interim executive director of the UNLV Alumni Association. And a very special thank you to Renee rivera Gelfi, our coordinator for programs and events, and for producing today's virtual lecture. Our next Rebel Recharge is scheduled for Friday, August 20th. The topic is Lessons Learned from COVID and the Path Ahead, presented by Dr. David Schwartz. We have a robust schedule of events, both new and familiar, coming this summer and fall. I encourage you to visit our website, engage.unlv slash events, for more information on all of our upcoming events. I'd also like to encourage you to share your excitement about the events you attend by inviting others to join and by posting on your social media channels, tagging at UNLV alumni. Our goal is to continue to grow our programs and events and create fun, educational and engaging opportunities for all of our alumni, faculty, staff, students and community members. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's program, Stephanie Balzer. Stephanie Balzer, CPCC is Associate Vice President of Marketing and Communications for the Division of Philanthropy and Alumni Engagement at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. She presents on communications, leadership, and personal and nonprofit development. Prior to a career in philanthropy and nonprofit management, she worked as a business reporter for the Phoenix Business Journal. Stephanie holds an MFA in poetry from the University of Arizona and is a certified personal and executive coach. We are thrilled to have Stephanie with us today to share her research and perspectives for six stories you need to tell about yourself. Please join me in welcoming Stephanie Balzer. Thanks, Stacy, and um, so nice to see everyone. Um, we're gonna jump in and get started. Jen, Amanda, so, Missy, so many people from the division, thanks for being here. Um, I'm excited. Um, I am in Flagstaff, Arizona. I'm house-sitting for my mom for the week, and had I known that there is no internet in Flagstaff strong enough to host a Zoom meeting, I would not have chosen this week to be here. So I'm on my hotspot. I'm saying this in advance, fingers crossed, everyone send good vibes that we aren't going to have any issues. Um, but um, thanks Stacy, Renee, Blake, everyone from the Alumni Association. Um, and we're just gonna play it by ear and see how it goes. So I wanna dive in so we can get started. Um, I'm Stephanie. Um, in addition to what Stacy shared, just to take it down a bit, um, I also um, have a, a picture of myself here from a few months ago when I was getting my hair colored. 
Um, I chose this picture for a reason. Um, when um, I was little, when I was growing up, I had naturally blonde hair. And then, you know, when you get to, as you get older, your hair gets darker, but I really still identify as a blonde. So I now spend money to make my hair blonde. Um, but the analogy I want to draw is that all of us are experts at stories, at how stories work and storytelling. It's the first mode of communication and education that we get when we're little, tiny little people. Many of you, I'm sure, are parents. We've all been kids ourselves. And you read to your kids. You enjoyed stories. That was how we learned. There's a reason for that. There's something very intrinsic about stories and the way they connect to us. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Just another um, little note to start on. Um, staying at my mom's, she's been cleaning out some closets and she found my high school diploma. And in it, she found the, I think it's the convocation. I was at our graduation, I was the person who gave the convocation to our class. So I'm going to offer you a dramatic interpretation of the convocation that I presented to Flagstaff High School when I was 18 years old. And I, and I say this because let me back up. I was, my mom said, You're so, oh, we have your speech, it's in your diploma. And I thought, oh my God, that's the worst thing ever. Why would I wanna read that? That's like reading your diary from when you were a teenager and recognizing how dramatic and silly you were. So I waited, I've been here a week. I didn't read it until this morning. And I don't know why this morning I picked, you know, I'm presenting in a couple hours, why then I decided to read it, but I did. So let me share it with you, it's short. On behalf of the class of graduating seniors of Flagstaff High School, I would like to say thank you to the faculty and staff for the superior education we have received. But our teachers have been more than just educators through, to us. Throughout the years, our teachers have influenced and shaped our lives in numerous ways. I speak for everyone when I say thank you for your dedication, sense of humor, patience, friendship, believing in us, it keeps going, encouragement, time and effort, and sometimes looking the other way. I assure you, I had no idea what that was about. We depend on our high school education as a stepping stone for the future, but more importantly, our high school years have been a time to grow, to find out who we are, to change. And we truly want to say thank you for being there for us. Well, um, when I read that this morning, I thought, all right, okay. It's funny how, you know, years later, so much of who I am is still reflected in what I knew about myself and what I believed in when I was 18. Um, so um, Renee is gonna work my slides because we're worried about my data. So Renee, go ahead and advance. Well, here's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna have a quick little experiment about why stories, why do stories connect to us and why do we wanna talk about them today? And then, because I think this is important, we're gonna quickly highlight what we're not talking about today. And then we'll get into the meat of why you're here, six stories that you want to tell about yourself. Then I've thrown in a surprise bonus content, a surprise slide that I just happened to run across the other day. And hopefully um, we'll have some time at the end of the presentation for your questions. And I am gonna have Renee send you these slides. This presentation is going to feel, you know, more like an experience than something you wanna take notes on, but I will be sending you this information so you have it. Okay, go ahead. So before we dive in, we're gonna do an experiment. And I think this is the fastest way I know to really connect to the idea of why stories. Why do, we, why do we wanna talk about stories? Why are those important? So I have a video here, it's very short. It's a minute and a half. So if you are multitasking, I would ask that you pause the other projects you've got and really 
turn your attention to this video because I think the experience of it is pretty cool. Um, after we watch it, we will um, we'll talk about that. This is, um, it doesn't have any sound, so don't worry if you can't hear anything. It's just a visual video. Um, so Renee, when you're ready. Okay, so we have a poll to go with this video and um, it's a very simple question. Did you see a story? Did you see a story? And Renee, you'll let me know when it's. Yeah, I'm gonna give them just a couple more seconds. We almost have all the results. Okay. Okay. 86% of us saw a story. That's actually pretty consistent with what the data shows. Um, this is, um, this is an experiment that was done in the 1940s. And it really, about 86%, the majority of us, as we're looking at shapes, two triangles, a circle, and a rectangle, the majority of us will see a story to a greater or lesser degree. But we begin to assign character, motive, temperament to the shapes that we see. Not everybody's brain works like that. 14% here say they didn't see a story. Not everyone sees that. But what this experiment really illustrates is that um, stories, we are inherently hardwired for stories. We make up stories. We're, we tell ourselves stories about ourselves, our potential. We tell stories about each other. We make up stories about why the world is as it is. And what we're going to do today is really look at, since stories are part of our natural, the way we learn, the way we see the world, the way we understand the world, how can we have more, um, how can we have greater skill in helping direct the stories that we want for reasons that include influence? Um, um, you know, we'll get into that in a second. But so, when I was practicing, I had 86% and that's, that's what we got here too. Um, go ahead, Renee, next slide. So stories are all around us. And then when and why, why do you want to tell stories? There's a few bucket reasons. And then I'm sure everyone here has your own personal reason for wanting to be a better storyteller. Stories help us relate. You know, if you get in a, in a job interview, someone asks you to tell a story. Stories help in fundraising, our profession, or in sales. Stories are a way to build rapport. Um, stories are a foundational leadership technique. Um, if you need to shift the energy, you can motivate teams with a story. 
it forges a deeper emotional connection and stories can be a tool for crisis management. Here's how we handled this crisis in the past and it went well. Here's how we handled the cri this crisis in the past and it didn't work. So stories are a way you can mold that. And finally, many of you here, I bet are educators or tr trainers. You have teams who work under you. Stories are a tool to um, train, to teach, whether you're in management or leadership and educator. So take a minute and you don't have to share this. This is just your own personal reason. Think because it's a lot to keep all of that in mind at once. Just take a minute and connect yourself, your personal goal or your personal motivation for wanting to be a storyteller. It just is a way to anchor what you learn and to start thinking about it as we go along. Okay, Renee, go ahead. Oops. Um, I think there's one more slide unless it got passed. Uh, that's going, uh, one more. Okay, what we are not talking about, I think this is important to, to really talk about um, because a lot of people will think I am not a storyteller. I am here to tell you there isn't a storytelling DNA. Everyone who is a good storyteller learned how to do it. Maybe they learned it without even knowing. They could have learned it from their family. Maybe they learned it unknowingly, but everyone learned it. Everyone in this room has the capacity to be a good storyteller. What we also aren't talking about is charisma. Charisma is a separate thing. It's its own thing, its own category. And people think I'm not, I don't like to be the center of attention. That's not who I am. That's really also not what we're talking about here. And then just another, what we're not going to talk about today is how to tell a story. That is a, a, a separate workshop. Um, there's lots that you can read about it. And I'm gonna point you to some of that, but we won't have time in one hour to really get into how to be a good storyteller. However, if that's something you're interested in, would love to talk about that with you. And then finally, I think this is important to point out in our day and age, because stories are so powerful, they are used as weapons, as weapons of misinformation, manipulation, gaslighting, um, you, you name it. And I am not here to promote that. I am here to talk about authentic connection, building healthy relationships and making a positive impact. But everything that we talk about here, stories, that is why they are such powerful weapons because they do make such an impact. So wanted to put that out there, glad it's on record. Okay, next slide. So here's the underlying premise of what we are going to do. In order to stand out, your stories need to show what you stand for. If there's kind of a guiding principle of what we're going for, it's that. And this is a quote from a researcher and consultant named Annette Simmons. Annette is the author of Story Factor. And, um, and, and just a slight correction to what Stacy said about me, this is not my original research. The six stories that I want to present come from Annette's book. That book is now 20 years old and it's fabulous. Um, so I highly encourage if this content feels interesting to you, please check it out. And um, so not my original research, but um, some original interpretation and something that I'm just really committed to, to talking about. So with that, let's dive in to the first, the first story you want to tell about yourself. Story one, who I am, who you are. All of us are, in, you know, when you meet someone, you introduce yourself. I'm Carol, I'm Bob, I'm Stephanie. Who you are is often then what you get asked to explain, say in an interview or meeting a team for the first time. That's what you begin with. Tell us a little bit about yourself. That's the invitation to tell a story. What this can do is break through negative emotions and get cooperation. 
how many of you have experienced sitting in a, maybe a seminar, a um, motivational seminar and feeling really disconnected from that speaker, suspicious until they tell some story that gives you a sense of who they are. A story helps to connect to emotions. I'm sure all of us have been in that place when we're asked who we are, we start reciting our resume. That we start, it starts spinning out of control. We talk about where we grew up. We talk about any number of things. That's different than a story. So that first story, who you are, is the first kind of fundamental story you want to learn. Um, I get started to give some of that story in my intro. Uh, you know, a little bit about my background, about who I was in high school, about who I was as a child. So that's story one. Story two. Story two is the why I am here story. If your goal is to get people to trust you, to be on your side, to listen to you, to um, participate, go along with your idea, you need to be very transparent about what's in it for you. Sound personal goals are okay. It's all right to have ambition and drive. We like that. People want to believe in you, but first they have to understand your motivation. And I have a, I have a story to share on this point. Um, when I was in second grade, I started taking piano lessons. And in Flagstaff, that's where I am now, where I grew up too, um, there were two piano teachers in town. There were two piano teachers that we all knew anyway. And I'm not gonna say their names, but one of the piano teachers, um, this, you know, you would go to her house, she had a beautiful house and she had a grand piano and you would, you, you know, she was very um, structured. You had to practice an hour a day and she taught the Suzuki method. And you knew that if you went to this piano teacher, you were going to be an exceptional musician. Probably you'd play in college, maybe you'd be professional. The other piano teacher, taught out of a small little music room off of her kitchen and it was floor to ceiling bookshelves with sheet music and you know an upright piano and 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 she and her husband um hosted dungeons and dragon stories and they played in a renaissance band and they taught she also taught people to play the harp and that's who i took piano lessons from and I'd only been playing a couple months when we had our first recital. All of the music teachers in town would bring all of their students and families together for this little recital. And all of us who, it was our first time, we had a rehearsal, a performance rehearsal. So we got to, um, you know, the, all the teachers rented uh, a kind of a auditorium room at NAU and we all, brought our families there and we all and we all played in our little recital and we were you know our teacher taught us you're going to get up from your seat you're going to walk across the stage and you're going to sit down at the piano quietly and put your hands in your lap and just sit there for a minute and then you'll perform your piece and then again quietly put your hands in your lap and then when you're done you'll stand up you'll look out at the audience look down at your feet look back up at the audience and go sit down. So it's the night of the recital and it's my turn. And I had only been playing a couple months. Uh, in fact, I knew my song memorized by keystrokes. I had a pattern. I didn't really understand it as music yet. So it's my turn. I walk up, I walk across the stage, I sit down and I put my hands in my lap and I look at the keyboard and I don't recognize a thing. I cannot, it looks totally foreign to me. At my house on my little Baldwin piano, the B of Baldwin coordinated with the middle C where I put my thumbs and knew how to play my song. Here's a grand piano, it's a Steinway. There wasn't even a B in that word. I'm just looking at it, you would, it, it made no sense. So I made my best guess. I put my hands on the keyboard and played my song, put my hands in my lap, got up and looked at the audience. And I'm 
here I am, this little seven-year-old girl staring at the audience and they're staring back at me and you could just feel the tension because I had made the wrong choice. I had put my hands on the wrong notes. So I just was up there playing my little march with the confidence of Beethoven and it was a cacophony of sound. No, it was not a song. I'm sure they were like, is she, you know, is she, maybe she's dying. We need to give her a chance. I don't know. Who knows what they were thinking. But um, they, I looked at them. They looked at me. And there was a huge silence. And then I looked down at my feet and I looked up and the audience clapped and I sat down. After the, after the performance, after everyone had played, the, my piano teacher came up to me and it still gets me emotional and gave me the hugest hug. And she said, beaming, I am so proud of you. You did exactly what you were supposed to do. I had said, if you mess up, keep going. She didn't expect me to mess up the entire song, but um, she just was so proud of me because I made it through that performance. And that's a story from my childhood I'll never forget. And it's taught me some fundamental things about life that I still hold on to, which is, you know, you're not going to die. If you make a mistake, if you mess it up, you're going to be okay. Jump in before you're ready. You never know what will happen. And you can't learn those lessons any other way. And third, if you're in the position to offer someone that grace and find the positive lesson in their performance, give it to them because you could influence them for life. So I'm telling the story as a, as a why I am here. Um, when I feel, I, I, I think there's something really in me that is curious and interested in sharing about storytelling with people and sharing about it in a way that makes an impact at, for a group. And the only way I can do that is with practice. You know, hopefully I'm not gonna hit all the wrong notes, but I'm jumping in and that's why I'm here today. I believe in this work and that takes us to our next slide. So story three, after you have given people reason to trust you, they understand why you're there, you can then begin to give them the vision. What is in it for them? What can you see for them? What is the context for the struggles and the complications we have to get through to make it to the finish line? Um, and another thing I wanna point out here, your stories don't always have to be about yourself. A vision story in particular can be about someone else, can be about the vision of an organization, can be about, um, the vision you see for clients, for students. And this also can be a time to tell a story. Here's a question that's very common in an interview. Who was the best boss you ever had? Here's a story about the best boss I ever had. My first real job out of college, I worked for a business newspaper in Phoenix. It was a weekly. I was not trained as a journalist, so I was very proud to be there. And um, we had a very, very chaotic work culture. I'm sure no one can relate to that. Um, but, you know, we would miss deadlines. We'd be at work till midnight trying to get things done. There was a lot of drama. There just was a lot of, you know, it just, we believed in the work, we liked each other, but I would not say it was a fun place to be. And uh, then we had an opportunity to hire a new reporter, or a new editor, executive editor. So this would be the person in charge of the newsroom. And his name is Don. Don came from the, uh, he was a sports reporter. So we already had ideas about who a sports reporter was. They're kind of jaunty, they're not academic. They're not serious about business. So we had some ideas about who Don was going to be. And um, we really wanted Don to come in and say, here's our vision. Here's the big picture. We're gonna win all the awards. We're gonna scoop the dailies and we're gonna bring truth to power. We are the, we are the newspaper. But that's not how Don came in. He came in and he said, you know, here's, here's what he laid out. 
I want you to be in your desks at 8.30 on deadline day. We're putting the paper to bed at 6.30 on Wednesdays. Your columns are due at three o'clock on Monday. And we're gonna have a meeting every Thursday at 10 a.m. You're gonna bring your stories and we're gonna plan out the next week's paper. And you can imagine, you know, for all of us who had a grand vision of who we are, uh, this was um, really not, really not a vision. It wasn't the vision we were signing up for. We, we, were, um, we were frustrated and we were, we were not on board. However, through the course of, you know, a couple months, things start evening out and we start seeing that because of that stableness and that steadiness and that example that Don set by also, you know, abiding by the rules, um, we were able to beat the dailies, begin winning awards and begin doing the job of true journalism. So I always come back to that as one of the best bosses I ever had and the story of a vision. I think people who know me, a couple of, you, of people here on my team, what I am as a leader is stable, is steady, stable. I, I see the real power in setting that structure and then allowing for great things to happen. So, um, so, so that's just an example of how you can tell a story of vision. Your story of vision doesn't have to be about you. It can be about someone who influenced you. Okay, story three, let's go to story four. The teaching story. Teaching stories are really useful for having, ha, ha, having, halving, having, half, take, making, turning in half into half the learning and teaching time. Uh, why do they do this? Why do teaching stories work? Because they combine the what and the how. They demonstrate value as much as skill. Here's where you might tell teaching stories. Here's how an exceptional student did it. Here's how, you know, um, Mrs. Jones, the best receptionist we ever had did it. Here's how, um, you know, here's the best advice I ever got and did and ignored as a kid. You know, teaching stories give context to, to what you could say a million times in another way. When I was, I lived in Tucson and I was very interested in storytelling. This was the first time I'd ever participated in a live storytelling event. And um, I didn't know what I was doing. Again, I just jumped in and I thought, I'll just jump in and figure it out as I go. But one of the other storytellers that night told a teaching story that I'll never forget. She was a veterinarian living in Tucson. And um, she had uh, a family come in and they had a little kitty and their cat had injured its leg. And somehow the injury to the leg was not repairable. They had to, they couldn't repair that, that leg. And um, they had determined that they were going to amputate that leg. And a cat can live, you know, great on three legs. It can just hobble around, it's fine. Um, so, Surgery went great. You know, they go in and they remove the cat's leg and everything's great. And then they get in the recovery room and the vet realized they had amputated the wrong leg. And at that point, the only thing that they, they didn't have a choice but to euthanize the cat. And then she had to call the family and tell them what had happened and own up to that mistake and hope that they forgave her. It was a very vulnerable story to tell and I saw Stacy react and, and, and it was a, a very vulnerable story for someone who still worked as a vet to tell. And I'll never forget that story uh, never forget her um, vulnerability in telling it, her bravery in telling it. But she began to talk after that story of the procedures that she and her team put in place to ensure that that never happened again. And you can imagine, imagine working for that vet, coming in as a vet tech, or coming in as, you know, 
part of that team and being told, here's our process. Here's why we work with the family to, to make sure we understand what, what procedure is going to get done. Here's why we double check and triple check. All of that can, can, can be told, but it's not going to have the emotional impact or the, or the resonance as telling the story of why they put that structure in place. So the teaching stories, that's an example of having, I think I wrote that. I don't know if that's the right spelling of that word, I apologize having that time, having that teaching time. Okay, um, I also, you know, demonstrates values as much as skill. You know, the other thing about that particular vet was um, the honesty. You know, she, she, she was an honest person who called that family and explained what happened. She could have said any type of story but she told the truth. So, so that demonstrates something about her value of, of honesty and being forthright and, and owning up to her mistake as well. Okay, story five. Okay, the I know what you're thinking story. This is a story, I'm gonna give you a few examples of when you might use this. I know what you're thinking. I've changed jobs a lot over the past 10 years. I know what you're thinking. My dad owns the company. I know what you're thinking. I'm too old to work in a startup. I know what you're thinking. I haven't done this kind of work before. The I know what you're thinking story is really tied to that idea of who I am story. You could substitute it for that or you could combine it but this is really the story that gets ahead of what you think or you suspect someone else might be assuming, you know, because that is what we do. We make up stories. So this is a way to disarm that story a little bit. Um, my own personal, I know what you're thinking story is tied directly to presenting today at a university. When Renee asked me, you know, when Re Renee told me about Rebel Recharge months ago, and I was like, that's so cool. I want to do it. And she said, we'd love to have you. And then I think I kept ghosting her and putting her off and pushing it back and trying not to be the presenter. I wanted to do it, but my deepest fear was, I know what you're thinking. That girl isn't a researcher and she doesn't have a PhD because that is the credential at a university that earns you the respect and the center stage. In fact, um, I, I got an MFA in creative writing from University of Arizona. And, and, and part of this, I know what you're thinking story is still my own reconciliation. Um, so after I earned that degree, which is a terminal degree, but I really wanted getting a PhD was like, if you had that, you were this, you were guaranteed smart. You were, you were smart and you were noble. That was like the best thing you could do with your life. So I was on track to do that. After I got my MFA in creative writing, I was taking master's classes in literature and planning to apply for a PhD program. And in fact, one day I'm in this class and it was the fall semester, probably just a few weeks from now. And I, um, it was, I think it was, you know, post-World War II European literary theory and experimental literature. It was something crazy like that. And I was very excited for it. And I went out and I bought the packet at that time. I don't know if this is still how it's done, but at that time you bought a packet, a thick packet. It's an excerpt of readings. That was gonna be the material for the class. It was not cheap. It was like $80 for Xerox copies. So I bought that and I'm sitting there and I come to class, it's the first day of class. I'm sitting there and I've got my packet on my table. And I look over at Josh Josh went to MFA school with me. Josh was a superstar and Josh unzips his backpack and Josh starts taking book out after book 
after book. He makes this whole stack of books on his desk. He probably had 12 books on his desk. And at this time, as a student, I was beginning to recognize that to turn in a 30 page paper, I had to write 90 pages. And even then, I thought my papers were good. They were good, they were good. But they were never, you know, it always felt like I was working twice as hard as everyone else. And I started to feel like, you know, I could get an academic job, but maybe I'm not gonna have the, my choice of academic jobs. And so I was reconciling this, but I also have a belief that if you want to do something, you can, you know, if you put your mind to it, you can do it. Um, so I was operating on that foundation. And then I look over at Josh's desk and he has 12 books stacked there. And they were all the source materials for what I had bought in my packet. I bought the packet, Josh bought all, brought, bought all the books. And in that moment, I had to reconcile with the idea that maybe ac traditional academia was not my path. And I didn't feel a sense of shame. I really felt a sense of, okay, I gotta figure out what it is. I, I think the thing that I have staked my dreams on, the thing that was most important to me in the world is maybe not gonna be my path. Um, so, so when Renee said, do you wanna present? And I, I started to feel that old, I, I know what they're thinking. I am not an original researcher. What, what is my space to contribute? So getting in front of that story is, is a way that you can turn and own that story. So that's story five. And our final story, story six, values in action. I actually think in the book, these are flipped, but it doesn't really matter. Values in action. How many of you have heard someone list off, you know, here's my core values and they recite their values and you think that's all fine and good. That's great. All of that's great. If you really want someone to see your values, you can tell a story about your values. That's really how you can make those values real. That's really how you can reach the heart. I don't know if anyone here has or ha has a hype song. Does anyone have a hype song? Someone says, Jen does. Okay, a hype song. A hype song is the song you play to pump you up, to feel who you are, right? To reconnect. A values and action story can be the story that reconnects you to your values, reconnects you to who you are. And I have Oh, yep, Stacy has one. We are the champions. Awesome. The hype song is the song when the when the baseball player gets up to bat, you play they play the song. Um, so you can have a values in action story. It can be your story, it can be someone else's story. Um, one of my core values is finding the gift, finding the gift in opportunity. And so when I hear other stories about that, they really resonate, including this one about Harrison Ford, Steven Spielberg, and George Lucas. So I'm sure everyone here has seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, it's 40 years old this year, by the way, if anyone wants to feel, yeah, we'll stop that sentence right there. Raiders of the Lost Ark. So it was just after George Lucas had, had produced, it was eight months after George Lucas had created Star Wars. And he said, I have an idea. It's for this character. He's kind of a swashbuckling anthropologist and his name is Indiana Smith. And Steven, Spiel Sp Steven Spielberg said, I hate it, but let's talk. Long story short, um, they cast Indiana Jones or uh, Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones. So this is in production now, you write the script. They're moving forward with it. Um, and, and the movie's kind of a bridge between old video production and new. Um, but so they're shooting um, in Tunisia. It's 130 degrees outside. It's very, very hot. Everyone also has food poisoning, by the way. 
So it's 130 degrees, they have food poisoning and they've blocked a day and a half for the scene. I'm sure you remember it if you've seen the movie, it's uh, they're at an Egyptian bazaar and Harrison has his rope and he's fighting, you know, people with swords and, you know, it's the action sequence, right? So they have a day and a half block to complete the sequence. Harrison Ford is sick. It's very, very hot out. And he says, is there any way we can do this in an hour? And jokingly, Steven Spielberg says, sure, if you shoot, if you shoot him, you know, he's got that final scene. It's the show off, it's the standoff between Harrison Ford and his, you know, enemy. And all of you who have seen the movie probably remember at that, they actually did film it that way. That was an innovation on the spot, you know, this. I think he's a, I don't, I don't know what he, he's the, the bad guy. He's got a big sword and he's, you know, moving it around and he's doing his show like a male peacock, you know, his feathers, feathers flayed. He's got his, he's doing his thing and Harrison Ford's 20 feet away and he just pulls out his gun and shoots him. And it's a wordless punchline. It gets the biggest laugh in the film. And what I love about that is that it just, took on the, the, the value of, or the, you know, what Spielberg did was flow with it. Here we are facing all these obstacles. How can we be creative in the moment? How can we flow with it? And that is something I aspire to be and do. So that is an example of the value in action. How can you just be, how can you flow with it? How can you be loose with it? And another example, you don't have to tell, stories don't have to be personal to you, you know? You can find stories that reflect what, you're, what you want to say as well. So let me look at time. Okay, we're right on where I wanted to be. So these are the six stories. Um, and now comes the bonus slide. Bonus slide. What are our pandemic stories? There's a consultant um, and he works specifically with the nonprofit sector. His name is Andy Goodman. He runs a firm out of Southern California called the Goodman Center. Um, Andy comes from a film background, you know, an, an experienced storyteller and he shifted his business to help uh, nonprofits and philanthropists tell their stories. So he has a fabulous newsletter called um, Free Range Thinking. One weekend years ago, I just binged the whole thing. I think I read all of them and, and it took me an entire weekend. Highly recommend if this is interesting to you. And if you wanna talk about, think about stories for your organization, follow Andy. He came out with a uh, newsletter just the other day that said, what are our pandemic stories? There's seven of them. We won't go into detail here, but I want to highlight one. Look at the second one there, how a core value was tested by the pandemic. This really speaks to the idea that what we've talked about, these buckets of stories you want to tell, can then be applied to your specific case. So you could tell a core value story, then maybe the new twist is how it was tested by the pandemic. What's the aha moment, you, your aha moment of the pandemic? What's the person, thing, or experience that most helped keep you calm and carry on? What did you learn about yourself? Okay, next slide. What's the unexpected silver lining? Um, what changed you forever? Changed your work or changed you forever? And what's the day, week, person you'll never forget. Within those broad categories of stories, then you can start drilling down to get very specific about your situation or, or your circumstance. You know, the stories I chose to tell today might not be stories that I would tell in another context. So once you kind of learn that foundation, they're all context specific. Um, okay, next slide. And that's it. We have a little bit of time for questions. And also, if you want to continue the conversation, I welcome um, a connection on LinkedIn. 
would love to talk about that more if that's something that um, if that's something that you're interested in please please reach out and connect so i'll just open it up with a few minutes if there are any burning questions Feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions for Stephanie. Susan does. Susan, go ahead. I do. <laughs> and then I just saw one just went up in chat too. I'll just ask mine real quick. Um, so from a professional perspective, as opposed to personal perspective, I'm looking to see because I know that stories are powerful. And one of the things that we're trying to do is institute change or I want to use stories to help support change initiatives. What how, you know, where do you start? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, I would look at those buckets, you know, and maybe there is a vision story. Um, so that that is where that is where the the um, that is the next step. So the follow-up to this workshop, you know, this is kind of the what stories to tell, why you want to tell them. The next step is how do you tell them? And that's where you dig deep and really begin, you know, there's a whole structure for how to tell a story. And one book that I would recommend, and I added it, so you'll get this uh, kind of a short annotated bibliography. There's a writer named Lisa Cron, and she has a book, it's, you can get it on Audible as well, called Story or Die. It's a great book and it gets specific to your audience. What is the story? your audience needs to tell, needs to hear. And she begins to walk you through some real concrete tips and steps for getting that story on paper. But that is hard. That's, that is uh, uh, the part of this workshop that, that we're not addressing today. Is, all right, how do you do it? Thank you. Um, Amy, Amy asked in the in the chat, do you re recommend that you write out your stories and practice them before your interview? Um, I have some stories canned. I kind I do, you know, you can have those stories. You could do all the prep you want, and then you're in, maybe your interview doesn't ask that question. However, you can also use the questions to begin sculpting the story, you know, leading into the story that you want to tell. Um, I don't know that I write them out word for word, but I do think about mapping out an arc for the story. So I know kind of how I want to tell it. And also they can be imperfect. You can mess up, you know, once you kind of have that foundational framework for how to tell a story, you, your audience will be very, very forgiving. Um, you know, you can back up and say, wait, I forgot to tell you this part. That's how we hear stories, you know? Um, but I do say them out loud. I do think there's value in saying out loud those stories, especially the ones you know you want to hit. I know what you're thinking story or here's who I am story. So it's, I think, a combination of both for me anyway. I don't know if anyone is watching the show Hacks on HBO Max. It is set in Las Vegas. And um, Jean Sharp is the lead character, and she um, is a comedian, and she has a, a residency in Las Vegas in the show. And you see a scene, and I think it's the penultimate or the last episode, where she's talking out and practicing her performance, you know, her, her routine. Um, there certainly is the stories that I've told you today. I think I said them out loud um, in the living room, you know, a couple times this morning and last night. Yeah, Stephanie, I just, I wanted to share um, something that when Susan asked that question, I had the same thought process about changing behavior, you know, with different generations. Um, you know, in, in trying to motivate people to a different outcome and changing mindsets. Sometimes telling stories really can help with that, right? I can see that. And 
And maybe it's better than having a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, chair to chair and more, make it more open. Yeah. You know, Andy Goodman has this, uh, one of his um, newsletters is about the power of data and the power of storytelling. And he ran a test and, and you know, it was like an A-B test. And some people, you know, it was a fundraiser. Let's say it was a fundraiser. I don't remember the details, but some people got the case for support that just had the data. Some people got the case for support that just had the story. And then some people, got the blended story and facts together. And that was what was most powerful, you know, finding a way to contextualize. Um, and we didn't do a lot of that here, but you all participated in that experiment, you know, the objective experiment at the very beginning of getting to watch that short film and seeing if you see a story, so. It's how, how people make you feel and how we felt that emotion, so powerful. You're right. Yes. yes. Um, well, I want to thank you all again very, very much. Um, it was fun. It was good practice. Please hit me up on LinkedIn. Also, if you have feedback, I am accepting of that. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Yeah, my pleasure. I love you. You did amazing. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, everyone, today. Have a wonderful weekend, and we will see you again very soon.